Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the program on Inf information justice and intellectual property. And we're delighted to have you here uh, to discuss uh, today's oral argument in the case of Medtronic versus Bo uh, Boston Scientific. Um, the idea of this series is that we are a law school here in Washington with a robust intellectual property program. And the Supreme Court has taken a deep interest in the field of intellectual property in recent years. Um, and so taking advantage of our interest in the subject matter and our location, we thought it would be great to um, ask counsel involved in the cases uh, to come up and share with us their views about the case and about the, the argument on the day of um, so that we can all get more familiar with it. And we're delighted that uh, some of the counsel in today's case were willing and able to do so, and we've, we're joined by additional commentators. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Professor George Contreras, who will be moderating this session. But I'm, th I'm thankful for everybody who's here in the audience and also to the people online um, and to the co uh, Federal Circuit Bar Association, which is co-sponsoring this, uh, this event. Thank you very much. Well, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk with you about today's Supreme Court argument in Medtronic versus Boston Scientific, Guidant, and Murkowski Family Ventures. Um, I'm George Contreras. I teach uh, intellectual property law here at Washington College of Law. And we've got a panel today that um, is, uh, has been to the oral argument and can tell us something about what was heard and what the case uh, is shaping up to look like. So I'll briefly introduce the panelists. And then what I'd like to do uh, for students and others who aren't so familiar with the case is give you about five to ten minutes of background on what the facts of the case are and what it involves. And then we'll turn it over to the panelists to talk briefly about what happened today, um, how the case went, and what the outlook is. So starting to my immediate left, uh, we have Brian Fletcher from Wilmer Hale, who represented the petitioner in the case, Medtronic. Uh, to his left is Jonas Anderson, my colleague here at American University, who will be talking about the uh, Murkowski Family Ventures uh, argument. Then to his left, uh, we have Roman Melnick from Goldberg, Lowenstein, and Weatherwax, who wrote the brief for Amicus Curiae Tessera Technologies. And at the far end of the table is Megan LaBelle, who teaches law at Catholic University Law School here in town, and who uh, is the first person, I believe, to have written an article about this case, and uh, will be able to uh, give us some of her analysis and um, commentary about the argument and the case. So for those who haven't been following this case, it is essentially about the Federal Declaratory Judgment Act, right? And that act allows a person who is under reasonable apprehension of suit to bring his own suit in order to resolve the legal issue and remove the cloud of liability that might be hanging over his head. These actions are called declaratory judgment actions or DJ actions, and they're used in a whole range of types of litigation, not just patent suits. But this is a patent suit, and DJ actions are not uncommon at all in patent cases. They typically arise when the patent holder is threatening or even aggressively offering to license its patents to someone who is potentially infringing those patents. So under the DJ Act, the potential infringer can go into court and say, Judge, I am under reasonable apprehension of being sued for patent infringement, but I don't think I'm infringing, or I think the patent that's being asserted is invalid, so, Judge, please resolve this matter so that I can get on with my business and remove this cloud of uncertainty that's hanging over my head. And the court will do that. They'll have an entire trial relating to infringement, validity, and so forth. So, what happens then when an alleged infringer patent takes a license under the patent? When you're licensed, the licensee is authorized to operate under the patent without fear of suit by the patent holder, right? You have the right to practice the patent, usually in exchange for some kind of monetary royalty. So if a licensee discovers information or somehow comes to the belief that the patent under which he's licensed is invalid or that he doesn't infringe it, does he still have to pay royalties? Under the doctrine of patent misuse, a patent holder can't charge royalties under an invalid patent or to people who don't infringe his patent. But if you've signed a license agreement, the licensee may still be paying royalties even though the patent is not valid or he doesn't infringe. And what's worse for the licensee is that with a valid license in place, he's completely free to operate under the patent, so he's under no apprehension of suit uh, 
by the patent holder and under the statutory case or controversy test under the Declaratory Judgment Act, he ordinarily wouldn't be able to bring a DJ action to challenge the patent or to argue that he's not infringing. So, as we all probably know, in 2007, the Supreme Court changed that rule in its case, Metamune versus Genentech, and held that a licensee can bring a DJ action to prove invalidity or non-infringement of a patent under which he's licensed, even if he's still paying royalties under the license and there's no active dispute with the patent holder. So this means that, in reality, the licensee who has no apprehension of suit from the patent holder can bring a DJ action um, to claim that he's not infringing. But what the court did not determine in 2007 in Metamune is which party in such a DJ case has the burden to prove infringement or non-infringement. It means does the licensee who brought the DJ action have the burden to prove that he's not infringing the license patent, or does the patent holder have the burden to prove that the licensee is infringing? And this is the issue that the court considered today. So today's case relates to two patents covering a cardiac resynchronization therapy device, or CRT, which is basically an advanced form of pacemaker. It was invented in the 1980s by doctors Murkowski and Mower, two very well-known cardiologists. The patents were assigned to an affiliate of Dr. Murkowski's Murkowski Family Ventures. And in 1991, the patents were exclusively licensed to Eli Lilly. So Lilly and the petitioner Medtronic were longtime competitors in the pacemaker market. They'd been involved in patent litigation since 1983. In 1991, shortly after Murkowski granted an exclusive license of the two CRT patents to Lilly, Lilly and Medtronic settled that litigation. The settlement agreement contained a number of cross licenses, as they often do. Medtronic licensed about 300 patents to Lilly. Lilly licensed about 100 patents back to Medtronic um, at a 3% royalty rate. And among the patents licensed to Medtronic were the two Murkowski patents on CRT. So in 2007, and there, there are quite a few procedural things that happened in between that I will skip over. But in 2007, Medtronic brought this action to establish that certain of its cardiac products did not infringe the Murkowski patents, right? So it could stop paying the 3% royalty. And there have been lots of issues that were considered by the courts. But the one that's today before the court is kind of a threshold issue, which is which party has the burden of proving that those two products or those products of Medtronics do not infringe the Murkowski patents. So generally, a party seeking relief in a lawsuit bears the burden of proving that the allegations in his complaint. Well, likewise, a patent holder suing for infringement of his patent generally must prove the infringement. So under those rules, when Medtronic brought its DJ action alleging non-infringement of the Murkowski patents, Murkowski would have borne the burden of proving that Medtronic did, in fact, infringe. So the district court followed that rule place the burden of proving infringement on the patentee, on Murkowski. But the Federal Circuit reversed that decision, reasoning that you know, this is not actually a claim for infringement, but because, because the license agreement re remains in place, Medtronic is not actually infringing the patents. Remember, it has a license to use them. Rather, the determination that the Federal Circuit seemed to focus on was whether Medtronic had a contractual obligation to keep paying royalties and though there may have been an overlapping determination as to whether or not the claims of the patent covered the Medtronic's products for contract purposes, um, the Federal Circuit seemed to believe that there was not an infringement determination going on. And therefore, because Medtronic was the one seeking relief from the royalty obligation, a contractual obligation, the Federal Circuit held that it is the one that should have the burden to prove that the royalties are not owed. Or, in other words, Medtronic had the burden under the Federal Circuit's ruling that it does, uh, proving that it did not infringe the Murkowski patents, reversed the district court holding. So Medtronic petitioned for certiorari, requested the Supreme Court reverse the Federal Circuit, and find that the burden of proving infringement lies back with Murkowski, as the district court held. So um, that's the question that's before the court. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Brian Fletcher of Wilmer Hale, 
uh, who represents Medtronic in the case. And I guess I should, I should uh, disclose before that that there was an amicus brief filed by a number of law professors in this case. Uh, I was one of those law professors who signed on to that brief, but I will be moderating and I will not be expressing the views that were espoused in that, in that brief, although any of my co-panelists should certainly feel free to do so. So, Brian, to you. So thank you, um, and thank you for putting on this event. I think it's great uh, that this opportunity is had to discuss the case so quickly after the argument, and obviously along with that comes the caveat that most of us are still just processing what happened <laughs> earlier this afternoon. Um, I think George's introduction nicely tees up the issues in the case, and there are a lot of interesting nuances that were raised at the argument, a lot more of them in the various briefs, uh, and I hope we'll get into some of those during the discussion today. I guess as a starting point, I'll just say that to my mind, the case, how you view the case has always turned a lot on how you conceive of a declaratory judgment action and the particular kind of declaratory judgment action that you have here. And I'll give you my, our biased view of how we conceive of these declaratory judgment actions and why they lead to the result that, that we think is appropriate, which is that the Federal Circuit got it wrong. Uh, and that's that the purpose of the Declaratory Judgment Act is to allow a party who is faced with a claim of liability to get into court and adjudicate that claim without exposing themselves to damages. Uh, and so there are these examples all over the legislative history of the Declaratory Judgment Act, which was passed in 1934. Patent cases were one example where I'm contemplating producing a product, and you say, if you produce that product, you will be liable to me for infringement, and I will sue you for infringement. And before the Declaratory Judgment Act, the only way that I could get a judicial determination of my right to produce this product that you claim is covered by your patent is if I went ahead and produced it, prompting you to sue me for infringement and us to go into court and me potentially to be held liable for treble damages and an injunction and paying your attorney's fees. And so there's a lot in both the legislative history of the act and in the subsequent case law that says the purpose of the Declaratory Judgment Act is to allow a party faced with that dilemma to get into court and to present the court with the same question, but to do it without prompting potential coercive or potential liability in a coercive action. And so instead of taking the disputed action, producing the product, and risking a traditional suit for infringement, what I do is I sue you. I come into court as the plaintiff, the nominal plaintiff, and sue you for a declaration that my contemplated action would not actually infringe your patents. Uh, and the, there's indications in the legislative history and in the subsequent case law that the, the act was meant to provide this new procedural device to allow parties to present a dispute, a case or controversy to the courts, but it wasn't meant to change the substantive law. So the, the legal rules that apply are exactly the same as the ones that would have applied if instead of filing a declaratory action, I'd taken the disputed action and prompted you to come and sue me. We're presenting the same question to the court, we're just doing it in a different procedure. And so from our view, what follows from that is that when parties bring a declaratory judgment action like that, all of the substantive rules have to stay the same, because that's the point. The point is to bring the same dispute for the courts before the courts, just in a different form. And we marry that point up with a lot of precedent from the Supreme Court that says that the allocation of the burden of proof is a matter of substance. It's a, it's a substantive law matter that's decided by Congress when it enacts the patent statutes or whatever other governing substantive law exists. And so our view is that because the substantive law allocates the burden of proof in an infringement action on the patent holder who's claiming an infr infringement, and because Medtronic's declaratory action is essentially just the equivalent of a coercive suit that Murawski Family Ventures would have brought had Medtronic, instead of bringing the declaratory action, breached the license agreement and just said, we're not going to pay you the royalties that you're asking for, the only way to allocate the burden consistent with the Declaratory Judgment Act is to say that it remains where it would have been had the same dispute come before the courts in a coercive suit, that is, in a suit brought by Murawski Family Ventures. So that's our most basic point in a nutshell. Okay, thank you very much. So Professor Anderson, what about the flip side of that? What, what about Murkowski's argument? So thanks, George. Um, so I think, I think Brian's really teed up the, the way you view this case. And, and the way Morawski Family Ventures views this is the general rule for declaratory judgments, or for judgments in general, is if you are the party seeking relief, you bear the burden of proof. And um, in this case, because of the way the licenses were set up, uh, Morawski is not asking for anything other than to just go back and leave the license, leave the status quo. So because um, Medtronic is asking for a change of the status quo, they should bear the burden of proof in this case. 
largely what they're saying is this isn't a question of infringement. So we, we don't need to get into the issues of is this infringement or not. Because we have a license, therefore there can be no infringement. What we're talking about are do the, do the, is the scope of this claim covered um, under this contract? Um, so it's really a claim scope argument, not an infringement argument, which is a fine line, uh, sort of a, a fine needle to thread. Um, but that's the, the essence of the argument um, from Rowski is that we're not in the infringement world, so we can't rely on the uh, fallback that the patentee bears the burden of proof uh, as to infringement. We're talking here about whether the, whether the claim scope here is covered under this contract. Um, and it's an easy argument to state. It runs into some problems, which I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, talk about as we go on. But that's essentially the, the different ways of viewing this. One is saying it's just a declaratory judgment. It's just a different way of arguing infringement. That's uh, Medtronic's argument. Uh, Morawski is saying, no, we're not really we're not even talking about infringement. Because we have a license, there's no uh, infringement allegation here. There can't be an infringement allegation here. All we're talking about is should this, should this contract continue in force. Uh, with regards to these patents and these products or not. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Roman Milnick, you filed an amicus brief on behalf of neither party, but uh, seeking vacator of the judgment on behalf of your client, Tessera Technologies. Can you tell us a little bit about why you filed that brief and what you argued? So Tessera Technologies is a company in Silicon Valley uh, that does a lot of research and development and licenses a lot of its patents. It has licensed its technology to some of the biggest semiconductor companies around. So as a frequent licensor, uh, it would normally be aligned with the respondent, in this case MFE. But as we started looking at uh, the nature of the case, it, it rapidly occurred to us at least that we thought that there was no subject matter jurisdiction in the case and that both parties really had misconceived the nature of the dispute. Uh, and therefore, rather than supporting either party, uh, we formulated a, a sort of an orthogonal argument that uh, didn't really support either side. And uh, our position was that the district court didn't have federal question patent jurisdiction and therefore the Federal Circuit didn't have appellate jurisdiction. And if, if there was any other basis for ju jurisdiction in the Federal Courts, the appeal should have gone to the Third Circuit. And therefore, the case had to be vacated and remanded back. Will you tell us why you thought there was no sure. jurisdiction? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to go into detail. I didn't know if that was the appropriate, if this was the appropriate time. Okay. Have to, just just uh, at a high level. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic thrust of our argument was that Medtronic, in particular, had fundamentally misconceived the nature of the dispute. You've heard Brian describe Medtronic's view that this is really just patent infringement litigation in reverse. And our position was that it really is, is not patent infringement litigation at all. Because the license remains in effect, and because the party's license specifically contemplated this litigation, in other words, it set up a contractual dispute resolution mechanism where uh, Medtronic could go into court, file a declaratory judgment uh, action where it said, we don't have to pay royalties because our products don't fall within the scope of the license patents or those patents are invalid or they're unenforceable. In our view, this was really a contractual dispute rather than a regular patent infringement litigation because the, con the license remained in effect. Um, and everything that was happening was happening as the parties had contemplated under their agreement and as they had agreed in advance it was going to happen. The, what flowed from that was, I guess, the somewhat unexpected conclusion that because this was a contract dispute, there was no federal question patent jurisdiction. Why? So uh, when you bring a declaratory judgment action, uh, the presence or absence of federal question jurisdiction is determined by looking at the coercive claim that would be filed, that's anticipated by your complaint. So uh, the, the Supreme Court had never squarely addressed the issue of how you figure out what a coercive claim is going to be anticipated by your declaratory complaint. The courts of appeals, at least in our view, had pretty uniformly said that the way you figure this out is you look at what the most likely claim is. Um, and we said the most likely claim in this case was going to be a counterclaim by the licensor saying, stop putting the money into escrow, give it to us, because your products fall within the scope of the license. It was not going to be a claim that said, 
we're, go you know, we're going to sue you for patent infringement. Why? Because the licensee was very unlikely to terminate the license because this license covered a lot of patents. Uh, they kept saying they didn't want to terminate the license. So if you look at the likelihood of what the most likely coercive claim wa was by the licensor, it was a contract claim and not a patent infringement claim. Well, if that's true, if the coercive claim corresponding to the DJ complaint is a contract claim, then this is, this is not a question, this is not a case that arises under the patent laws. It's a case that arises in contract law. And therefore, if the parties want to be in federal court, they have to establish diversity. Otherwise, uh, they have to go somewhere else. Um, th there is another wrinkle to this because there's another potential basis for federal question jurisdiction. Um, under Gunn versus Minton, the uh, Supreme Court's decision from last term, even if uh, the cause of action doesn't arise under federal law, there can be federal question jurisdiction if the case presents a, um, necessarily presents a substantial question of federal law. But uh, Gunn versus Minton last term held that these cases are pretty rare and far between. And a substantial question of law is really one that's important to the federal system as a whole. And uh, we argued that an, an, a determination of claim coverage between two private parties is not important to the federal system as a whole. And although Medtronic sort of dropped a placeholder footnote to that effect, they didn't really challenge, seriously challenge that argument. Uh, all of that being said, uh, our argument appears to have gotten no traction whatsoever uh, at the Supreme Court today, uh, although uh, Medtronic was clearly concerned about it and devoted a significant part of their reply brief to it. And um, Seth Waxman uh, told me on the steps of the court that he spent a significant amount of time preparing to answer questions about our argument. Uh, it never came to be. Okay, well, I definitely want to get a reaction to that, uh, but, but, but before, before we do, I'd like to move on to, to Megan LaBelle, who, who uh, has, has looked at and written a lot about the Federal Circuit and how it makes its decisions. So do you want to share with us some of your views? Sure. Um, so I'll just briefly make a couple of comments. Um, in, in this case, the Federal Circuit um, recognized that patent owners generally have the burden um, to prove infringement and also recognize that um, the declaratory posture of a suit uh, generally doesn't change that burden or shift that burden. But the Federal Circuit uh, claimed to be creating an exception for what it called uh, metamune type cases. So when um, there is a, a licensee in good standing, when the plaintiff who's bringing the declaratory judgment action as a licensee in good standing, uh, the Federal Circuit said that there should be an exception and it should be uh, the declaratory judgment plaintiff who bears the burden of proof. So um, just some uh, sort of thoughts on that. Um, a concern um, that I had, and I think that came up at the argument a bit today, was sort of how um, that rationale could um, be Sort of could sweep more broadly. So um, the, the Federal Circuit ex explained its decision and said that the reason that the burden should shift in metamune type suits is because in the Federal Circuit's view, the defendant, the patent owner, cannot assert a counterclaim for infringement since there's a license in place. And um, so uh, one concern is that um, this, this rule, even though it uh, supposedly just applies to these metamune type suits, suits could apply to other declaratory judgment actions where the, um, the, where the uh, defendant can assert a counterclaim. And um, certainly there are patent declaratory judgment actions where the defendant cannot assert a counterclaim for infringement because often the plaintiff will bring a declaratory judgment action before it is actually engaged in any sort of infringing or potentially infringing activity. So under the Federal Circuit's rationale in those cases, even if it wasn't a license or licensee situation, um, the, the plaintiff in the declaratory judgment action uh, would bear the burden of proof. And um, I think one of the concerns raised at the argument today is that that wouldn't just be true in the patent context, but in any declaratory judgment action where um, 
where the defendant doesn't assert a counterclaim or even is unable to assert a counterclaim because um, the, the plaintiff hasn't done anything yet to uh, to warrant that sort of claim, the burden would shift to the plaintiff. So um, that was one concern I had in writing on this area is how this rule that the Federal Circuit crafted, which appears to be pretty limited, how it could potentially sweep a lot more broadly. Great, thanks. Um, great, well, so, so I guess, Brian, I'd like to ask you if you could uh, talk just a little bit uh, and respond to, um, to Roman's argument, right? I mean, apparently uh, Seth Waxman, who argued the case at the court for, uh, for Medtronic, seemed to be prepared to, uh, to counter that, and your brief did uh, address it. We didn't get to hear much of the argument, though, unfortunately, at the, uh, at the court. How, how, would, how would Medtronic have countered the jurisdictional argument that was made? So this is, Roman is exactly right. We did spend a, a fair amount of our reply brief on this issue because I think it is um, very, very difficult to get one's head around. Um, so with, at the risk of heading rapidly into the weeds, and you should, you should yank me out if I, if I do that to us, um, it, just as Roman said, the way that you decide federal question jurisdiction in one of these declaratory actions is you ask, would there be federal question jurisdiction over the coercive suit, the hypothetical coercive suit that the declaratory judgment defendant would have brought, the, the, the suit that the, the patent holder is seeking to anticipate, and, or sorry, the suit that the declaratory judgment plaintiff is seeking to anticipate. And as Roman said, the, the challenge to jurisdiction presented in their brief is essentially that in their view, in this case, a patent infringement suit wasn't particularly likely. Uh, their view was that the suit that was really most likely to be brought by Murawski against Medtronic was some sort of a breach of contract suit that would have arisen under state law, and therefore there was no jurisdiction. And I, I think our answers to that, and there were a couple of different flavors to that argument, but our, our basic answer to that is that uh, as an initial matter, their argument about the likelihood of the suit by Murawski starts from the wrong premise, because their premise was, look, this is a pretty good deal for Medtronic. Medtronic has this license. It gets to bring a declaratory judgment action and litigate whether or not its products are covered by these patents and challenge the validity of these patents. And so we all know there's no way in the world that Medtronic is actually going to breach this license and potentially incur liability in an infringement suit that Murawski could bring only if Medtronic first stopped making payments. And that's just not going to happen. And I think we agree with him that that's just not going to happen. But our view is that the way you ask what the in hypothetical coercive suit that could have been brought in one of these declaratory actions is you ask what's the suit that would have been brought if the declaratory judgment plaintiff did the thing that it is claiming it has a right to do in the declaratory action. So in our view, the, the, the likelihood question arises not in the world in which we actually live, but in the world where Medtronic had said, we don't think we have to pay these royalties that are being demanded, and so we're going to stop paying them on the products that are in dispute here. And that the question that ought to be asked is, what suit would have happened if Medtronic had, in fact, stopped paying royalties? Because Medtronic is bringing this declaratory judgment action in order to establish its right to do just that, to stop paying royalties. And so that's the world in which you ought to engage in this sort of likelihood inquiry. Uh, and so our, our position was that if that had happened, if Medtronic had stopped paying royalties, um, it's pretty clear from the record, and this is something that Murawski said even in his brief in the Supreme Court, that it would have brought an infringement suit. Uh, and so, so our view on the jurisdictional question was essentially our complaint made it very clear that we were trying to anticipate a suit for patent infringement and not just some kind of contract action. And we also know that if we'd done what we claimed to have a right to do and what we were seeking to vindicate our right to do in the declaratory judgment action, Murawski would have, in fact, sued us for patent infringement and not for something else. And that that's enough to satisfy both the Article Three concerns that might be lurking under here, even after MedImmune, and also the, the statutory requirements for federal question jurisdiction. So uh, that, that is essentially the split, and that, you know, from what happened uh, this afternoon, it's pretty clear that the justices uh, bought that argument uh, on the briefs. Uh, the concern that I have is that Medtronic's argument, uh, followed to its natural conclusion, means that there is per se federal question jurisdiction 
in any licensee license or dispute of this type. In other words, essentially the, the, the split between Tessera's position and Medtronic's position is Tessera says look at the likelihood of breach and subsequent termination. And Medtronic says because a breach is theoretically possible, look what would happen after the breach, assuming the breach. So under Medtronic's view of the world, therefore, there will always be federal question jurisdiction in disputes of this type. Whereas under Tessera's view of the world, there will be some of the time and not during other times. The, the, the Supreme Court had never decided anything remotely on point in this area. In the courts of appeals, uh, well, the courts of appeals were a little bit all over the place, but I would say that it's fair to say that uh, most of them probably looked at the likelihood of the breach rather than the light, the, rather than assuming the breach and looking at the likelihood of what happened thereafter. So we thought that our argument would, if not persuade the majority, at least get some traction from somebody. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have happened. Well, interestingly, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead. Let me just jump in really quick and say, um, so uh, for Morawski, when you listen, when you read the argument, they're making contract-like arguments without explicitly saying, this is, we're in the contract world. And, and, and the reason I think, again, trying to thread the needle, is they don't want Tessera's argument to carry the day because they wanted the Federal Circuit. So they don't want to start over at whatever circuit they would have been in, um, essentially starting from scratch. Um, but they like the argument that we are outside the world of patent law. We're not doing infringement here. We're talking about claim coverage and scope of, of contract. So a lot of these sort of jurisdictional arguments bleed through even into um, Morawski's arguments and briefs, even though they don't so, so agree you, with the outcome. Of you the think they, they, want, they want to stay in the federal circuit bec just because they won? Well, I, I think that's a, that's a larger reason, right? <laughs> they, they won below. They just want a simple affirmance and the case is over. Um, yeah. I mean, speaking sort of as, as, as a non-party, most, most people, once you've litigated up a certain way, both losers and winners, <laughs> don't want to start over completely at, at a completely different court. That's not always the case, but... Um, that's why oftentimes the subject matter jurisdiction arguments come not from the parties but from somebody else. Well, you're right. So, so in the argument, um, you know, uh, the attorney for Murkowski um, repeatedly made this distinction that, that to me seemed like it was pressing the justice's uh, patience, right, between whether he was arguing about infringement or claim scope. Um, I mean, is that uh, yeah? Yeah, what I, think, about? I think. I mean, some justices I don't even think were willing to say there was a difference. Justice Breyer, <laughs> I think he said at one point, "You call it claim coverage, I call it infringement." Do you think he just didn't get the contract patent distinction, or do you think that this uh, was a deliberate that the justices? I mean, justice Breyer is a smart guy. I'm not going to yeah. say he, he didn't get it. I, I think he was he was being honest to uh, Mr. Newstead's argument, which was not a contractual argument explicitly. And so he, he said, you know, these are even though it can't be infringement in the sense that there's a license, we're talking about an infringement sort of uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I, I, think, I think MFB tried to, to find a balance and was probably unsuccessful. In other words, uh, by not willing to follow through the logical conclusion, uh, the, the, the logical consequence of this being a contractual dispute, which is if you're going to say it's a contractual dispute, you really have to say there's no jurisdiction. By trying to have it both ways, they painted themselves into a tough spot because yeah. they wanted to say this. And, and really, you know, I, I, touch, touching the merits slightly, even though we didn't brief this, I think that the Federal Circuit got it right but didn't put the right label on it. I think they got it right because this is a contract dispute. And if you call this a contract dispute, uh, you don't have to get into any issues regarding allocation of burden of proof and patent infringement. You simply say you have two parties that have a dispute about the meaning of a contract. The party that comes into court and says, I want an interpretation of the contract that favors me should have the burden of persuasion. And it's a question of state law. Sure. Which is, which is sort of the other part of, the, of, our, of our brief. By not wanting to make that argument because they, because they wanted to keep the case in the federal circuit and didn't want it vacated and sent back for reasons that I can't get into uh, because, of, you know, these would be privileged communications between us yes, and them. Yeah. 
uh, they painted themselves into a very tense, tough spot. Sure, sure, sure. So both Murkowski and the Federal Circuit were interested in keeping the Federal Circuit. Uh, and, and, and you're right, the Federal Circuit did really, I thought, got very close to saying this is a contract case. The, the I, I thought it was almost explicit in their opinion. The Federal Circuit has a very long history of attempting to establish patent issue jurisdiction without <laughs> yes. calling it that. Right, different uh, uh, issue, but yeah. So, but th because this case was decided before Gunn versus Mint, mm -hmm. I think they didn't give it, a, get, didn't give the jurisdictional question right. a second thought because before, under circuit precedent, before Gunn versus Mint, there was mm -hmm. clearly federal question jurisdiction. All of this only arose because Gunn versus yep. Mint got decided while the cert petition was being briefed. Right. Megan, for you. Did you want yes, I was just going to say um, that I think the justices, as Brian discussed earlier, were focused on sort of the hypothetical world that you have to think about in a declaratory judgment action. So the justices were thinking about um, what coercive action would have been brought had Medtronic stopped paying royalties. And in that hypothetical world, um, Medtronic would be infringing because there'd be no license. And so to them it was, if that's the way you think about a declaratory judgment action, then there is infringement. Whether you call it claim coverage or infringement, in the, hypo in the hypothetical world, it's infringement, which is the world you operate in in a declaratory judgment action. Okay, great. So, so we've talked a fair amount about the, uh, about the merits and the legal arguments. I guess I, I, I'd, I'd be curious about hearing more about, you know, what, what this case might mean. Uh, more generally, and why? Why the Supreme Court granted cert here? I mean, was it really just because they thought the Federal Circuit got it so wrong that they they couldn't allow this to stand as as precedent, or were they looking at some bigger issue that, that you know they they thought they needed to address? And 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 so let me just insert there the plug for um, the the law professor's brief, which really was was a policy oriented brief, right? That that brief, uh, which I was not the primary author of, um, talked about some of the incentives in the patent system and and uh, the benefits of clearing patents, the benefits of clearing out uh, bad patents, and you know easing the way, making it as easy as possible to clear out bad patents, and the way to do that is to make it easier to bring declaratory judgment actions um, and therefore, you know, not have the declaratory judgment plaintiffs be the ones um, with the burden of proof, making the patent holders uh, have that burden. And so I, I just wonder if you think that's something that the court was, was thinking about. They certainly didn't respond to that, that brief <laughs> either in the, in the oral argument. Um, but any thoughts about why they took cert? So, so I'll, um, I'll weigh in on this. So I, I was actually surprised how little we heard about policy at the argument today because um, uh, the briefs, not just uh, the law professor's brief, but um, the, the party's brief, Medtronic's brief, talked about policy quite a bit too. And um, the idea is that if you shift the burden to um, the declaratory judgment plaintiff, then from a policy perspective, that might dissuade uh, plaintiffs from bringing declaratory judgment actions, and that um, is is a bad thing because then fewer potentially weak or invalid patents will uh, be subject to challenge. So um, we didn't hear much about that today, but I think that's one possible reason why the court um, granted cert. I think another is that Metamune was decided, you know, not that long ago, and in my opinion, the Federal Circuit doesn't like Metamune, and. Um, has has really struggled with um, declaratory judgment jurisdiction since Metamune, how you establish whether there's a case or controversy, and this was an issue in the Myriad case. Um, it's been, the Federal Circuit has really been all over the map on subject matter jurisdiction since Metamune. So um, I think potentially that's why the Supreme Court weighed in because um, this was one way for the Federal Circuit to sort of undercut Metamune um, in a way, in sort of an indirect way. So perhaps that's why the Supreme Court um, took this case. <laughs> because, of course, Metamune was itself a reversal of a Federal Circuit precedent in gen probe and vices. Right. Um, so, yeah. We, an we eight know to, that it was an eight to one reversal, yeah. <laughs> Uh, why they took 
Well, I, I'm going to give a slightly facetious answer. I think with respect to two courts of appeals, the Supreme Court uh, tends to exercise smackdown jurisdiction. <laughs> Uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, where I live, is one, and the Federal Circuit is the other. I, I think that they tend to take several cases a year just to show the Federal Circuit who's boss. Uh, at the same time, they don't want to take any cases that involve really hardcore patent issues because <laughs> those are really hardcore patent issues. So they look for cases that have relatively understandable procedural issues where at the same time they – while they keep saying that they're not a court of error correction with respect to the Federal Circuit, they frequently do see themselves as a court of error correction. So I think they granted certiorari because they thought the Federal Circuit was wrong and it was a case out of the Federal Circuit. I don't think they gave a lot of thought to the question of whether or not it was uh, important or not. Uh, I, at some point, I would like to speak to the policy issues, but maybe at, 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 another, at another juncture. Yeah, let me, let me um, sort of agree with Roman, but in a less... Um, Facetious. Facetious way. Um, so if I had to paint with a broad brush about the Federal Circuit Supreme Court interaction over the last 15 years, it would be that when the Federal Circuit makes a, uh, a rule that either uh, says patent law is different for some reason or we need a really formalistic rule while all other sorts of law needs more uh, standards-based rules, uh, Supreme Court tends to take those in reverse. And there's no competing juris there's no competing uh, circuit. There are no circuit splits on patent cases. So the Supreme Court does sort of act like a regulator. Um, instead of waiting for a circuit split, they just take things that look obviously different. And this looks obviously different. It's the Federal Circuit saying, yes, the general rule for declaratory judgments is this, but in these types of patent cases, we need a different rule. And that, I think, just triggers alarm bells um, for the justices, saying, why should it be different? Uh, in the patent sphere and, and not in other, other spheres. Okay, well then, so, so let's, let's shift to the, the policy. And, and Brian, so in your, your brief uh, and uh, for petition, it did raise some, again, weren't discussed at all by the justices in their questions. I think Justice Kennedy once mentioned uh, fundamental fairness. Well, so I, I, I don't – I'm not a patent expert, and so I don't, I don't intend to speak with the, the authority that some of my co-panelists might, might have on the questions about how this is going to be viewed in the, in the patent community. I, I will say that the, the policy arguments that we advanced in our brief were along the lines of what you sketched at the beginning of the discussion, uh, that there are good reasons not to make it more difficult for people to challenge the validity or, as particularly at issue here, the scope of patents. Uh, because when people bring those challenges, you get clarity about what the scope of the patents are, and there are Supreme Court decisions saying that that's a valuable policy objective. And I think you're right that those policy-type questions didn't get raised. I think there's another set of arguments in the case that you could call policy questions that, that did get raised somewhat. And that, that is an argument that's in our brief. It was in the Solicitor General's brief. I think it was to some extent raised in the – maybe in the law professor's brief uh, – that it, it's difficult to – prove a negative and that when a party comes into court and says, I'm not, my products do not infringe a patent, it makes more sense to assign the patent holder who's claiming that there is infringement to it prove why there is infringement uh, as opposed to placing the burden on the person who's claiming that their products do not infringe and, and sort of require them to anticipate and then refute what the infringement theories might be. And I think there actually was some back and forth on that question right. from Justice Alito and, and Justice Breyer, which is maybe a lower level policy question, but, uh, you know, how will this affect patent litigation sort of in the trenches Ooh. type question. Um, well, you, you, would, you would want to jump on. Oh. So I, I want to first speak to the, to the question of proving a negative. Uh, I think there's a good reason why that argument was not made in the Federal Circuit. Uh, because to a patent lawyer, the argument really doesn't ring true, and I was very surprised that MFE wasn't much more aggressive um, in, in uh, taking that on in their briefs. Uh, it's routine to prove non-infringement in all sorts of contexts. Uh, under the patent statute, there's Section 295, uh, which we mentioned in our brief, where under certain circumstances the accused infringer has to prove non-infringement in various state law tort actions, legal malpractice, trade disparagement, 
uh, a party might have to bear the burden of proof uh, in proof non-infringement. And proving non-infringement is a, a, maybe not in a formal sense, but establishing non-infringement is a routine part of every piece of patent litigation. Uh, because uh, as uh, MFV's lawyer tried to uh, explain today in response to Justice Breyer's question, to show non-infringement, all you have to show, show is that one element is missing. So I mean, look at the reality of what likely occurred within Medtronic. Medtronic didn't simply put these products out of the marketplace and then say, gee, do we think we infringe or not? Clearly, these products were designed with MFE's patents in mind, opinions were obtained, lawyer, patent, experienced patent lawyers analyzed the question of whether or not these products infringed or not, and there are internal opinions that, that, that went through element by element Murawski's patents and addressed the question of whether or not there was likely uh, infringement or not. So the notion that Medtronic is somehow going to be t taken by surprise by the question of why don't you infringe uh, is just, it's, to me at least, not credible. Of course they know why they think they don't infringe. Before they put this product on the market, they, they must have done an internal analysis. It's called a right of use analysis. Any responsible company that wants to, you know, uh, would do that. So that's, that's the narrow question. The broader policy question of what the effect would be of, uh, you know, the 9 to 0 reversal that's likely to occur in this case. Um, I, I, I think that it will actually be fairly narrow for the following reason. Uh, shortly after this opinion comes out, everyone will start contracting around it. One, parties will start allocating the burden of proof explicitly in the licenses. Two, uh, licensors will start pricing their licenses appropriately. So in the absence of an express allocation, the rate or the, the, the royalty rate or the royalty base, the royalty rate will go up or the royalty base will broaden to compensate the licensor for the risk of having to bear the burden of proof in this kind of litigation. So I think that the, the effect will be short-lived only retroactively with respect to licenses that are already in existence. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Uh, I, I think whatever opinion comes out, you're going to be able to largely contract around a lot of it. And that's true largely for metamine as well, right? A lot of these decisions that come out about procedural issues of patent litigation that affect licensees, it just changes the licensing negotiations and some of the pricing that goes into it. Um, I also point to, I think the first question of the oral argument was Justice Alito saying essentially, um, well, if that's all that's involved, the, the case doesn't seem to amount to quite as much as one might would have might have thought, right? So it, right from the start, it looks like it's going to be a narrow decision. And, and an, it's, it's a narrow issue, right? We're talking about uh, licensees that infringe and have these specific provisions. Well, if you agree with um, uh, Murawski's argument, only licensees that can't then uh, sue the, the people that are, are trying to get out of them um, in, the, in the contract. So uh, policy-wise, I don't see this having a huge effect on the marketplace, largely because you can contract around these things. <laughs> um, and on the question of is it hard to prove a negative or a positive, I, I do think in patent law that that's, it's true that proving non-infringement is not necessarily harder than infringement, but it is true that you do have to sort of anticipate claim construction, right? Um, and it's much easier to prove in uh, infringement when I'm the one setting the standards for what the claims mean. But if you have to both interpret what the claims mean and then point out which of these elements you don't meet, then the, the burden does seem a little higher. But it is true that you can, only, you can just find one element that you don't meet and then you're, you can prove non-infringement fairly easily. I also think, um, just to um, piggyback on what Jonas was saying, I think if you uh, shift the burden and if, um, uh, I mean, you have to think about in terms of uh, proving non-infringement or proving infringement. If a patent declaratory judgment plaintiff has to ultimately prove non-infringement, then you have to think about what they have to plead to. So at the oral argument today, um, the respondent's counsel said, well, you know, it's not that hard to prove non, um, it's not that hard to prove non-infringement because by the end of the case, the number of claims is limited significantly and so there's only five claims and everyone knows what they are and so they can prove non-infringement. But um, 
but the, the, this becomes an issue at an earlier stage, right? So for pleading, if you're um, a plaintiff in a patent declaratory judgment action and you have to prove non-infringement, well, then you have to plead that. And um, the Twombly-Iqbal plausibility standard applies to patent declaratory judgment actions, unlike patent infringement actions. So um, I would presume that the, the, the plaintiff would need to include some sort of facts and some uh, details in their complaint, which um, could be very difficult at the beginning of a suit. So um, while I think respondent's point was well taken at some point that the claims are narrowed, um, at the beginning of the suit the claims are not narrowed, so it could be very difficult uh, for um, the accused infringer to prove non-infringement. I, I guess I would respond to that by saying that district judges have uh, fairly plenary authority to manage these kinds of issues, both in terms of allowing amendment of the pleadings and allowing narrowing of the issues through uh, pretty much every district where a significant amount of patent, well, not every, many districts where a significant amount of patent litigation goes on have local patent rules that provide for various kinds of disclosures. Even if the licensee bore the burden of proof, uh, the, the licensor might still be the first to go under the local patent rules in terms of identifying the claims that are going to be at issue. So uh, you could still have the same sequence of disclosures that would narrow the issues, and the pleadings could be amended. So I think all of this is, is eminently manageable. I think ultimately we come down to the policy issues and how you view the suit. Do you view it as a, as a dispute about the meaning of a contract? or do you view it uh, as essentially patent litigation in reverse? And Medtronic has been successful in convincing the, the court to view it as patent litigation in reverse. And once you take that worldview, everything else follows their way. Well, so, so Roman, you've, you've sort of thrown down the gauntlet and said uh, you, you expect a 9-0 um, reversal. I hope not. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had high hopes for our jurisdictional argument getting some traction. But, my, you know, that the, once the word jurisdiction did, didn't get mentioned in the, in the uh, first five minutes, Seth Waxman looked relieved and I looked chagrined. Uh, <laughs> because I think we knew at that point which way the wind was blowing. So, yeah, I, I hope they say something about jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, or ma maybe I hope they don't so that the issue can be left for another day. But on the merits, I, I expect a unanimous reverse. It, it seems, seems ripe for one of those uh, pregnant footnotes that uh, get dropped. I, in that's, that would be my worst fear, because <laughs> instead of a plenary discussion, it could be a two-sentence footnote that would foreclose the issue mm -hmm. without it having been given as much thought as I would have hoped. If they're, go if they're going to rule against me on jurisdiction, at least I would hope that they would devote a couple of pages to it and talk it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, 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 won't, I won't put Brian on the spot as an actual party here <laughs> the, uh, and ask you what you think the other prognosis is, but, uh, but, but Jonas, what, what do, you, do, you, do you agree with the 9-0 uh, assessment? Well, I don't know about 9-0, but um, I, I, I do think at least the justices we heard from um, seemed to be supporting um, reversal in this case. Um, you, you never know about Justice Thomas because he was the one dissenter in Metamune, um, and we didn't hear from him today. So it's uh, possible it would be it could be eight one, um, and some of the Chief Justice's questions, um, I think, uh, were a little bit more supportive of uh, the respondent's position. Um, they seem to be questions that, at least to me, indicated. Um, that he might have decided metamune differently, um, but or you know, but but I tend to agree that um, I think there are at least five justices who will reverse this case. Yeah. So taking off my litigant cap and putting on my observer cap, uh, I think you can count. Uh, I would say Breyer, Scalia, Kagan, Ginsburg all look like they are going to reverse. Um, I'd probably say Alito, too. Thomas is the wild card. Uh, I agree that Justice Roberts, uh, if I had to guess, I would say he's on um, for a, he, he, he made questions that sound like he wanted to affirm, but you never know how the votes actually come out. But it, it would look like there are enough justices to reverse.
So, um, well, just to, I was just going to say, Justice Scalia seemed very firm in his uh, in his position, and I think it's pretty clear he would vote to reverse. And he repeatedly raised the issue of um, sort of how this rule would apply in declaratory judgment actions more generally, and seemed very focused on that question about um, you know what, what how would this rule play out in a different context outside the patent world in declaratory judgment actions. And he was the justice that I would have expected to be most interested in the jurisdictional arguments, since he is the one who tends to write all the sort of nerdy opinions of vertical choice of law and that sort of stuff. So once, once he wasn't interested, that wasn't a good sign. And I'll just say that the first line out of the respondent's mouth was something like, the Federal Circuit got this case right. That's never a good argument for the justices. That I don't think they'd like to hear that at all. So, <laughs> I, I, Just based on that, I think they're going to they're reverse. Fair, fair enough. Um, well, we have uh, a live audience here, as well as our audience in the, uh, the web world. If anybody in the audience has any questions, uh, we, we have some time. We have a microphone, I believe. That we, oh, there it is. So we will we'll keep talking amongst ourselves, but uh, if, if you have a question, please come to the mic and you'll be broadcast then. Okay. Oh, oh we have a young man coming up to the microphone right now. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice exposition of the, of the case. I'm, in reading, I've just been able to skim the, the transcript and um, I'm wondering if, from the patent perspective, if if the Federal Circuit decision was to be defended, what it what the best argument was. It's not clear to me. I understand this point about, you know, we don't want to call it a contract dispute for our own personal, uh, you know, motivations. But, but there seemed. I mean, Justice um, <clears throat> Kennedy seemed to suggest early on that his interest in the case was based on the sense of fairness to the patentee, that there was something wrong about a situation in which a person enters into a license, effectively conceding that they need the license, and then trying to have it the other way and flip around. And so that, that element of fairness seemed to be a motivation for taking the case, but it kind of dropped out. But, but in the, can you talk maybe about the Federal Circuit's sort of sympathy with that argument and whether there is actually an argument that the patent law is different, that patent licensing deserves special treatment. What, what's the best argument for, for that proposition? So uh, the facts of this case are extremely unusual and uh, don't easily lend themselves to that proposition because unlike most licenses, this license specifically anticipated litigation between the parties. Uh, so, and it, and it provided a procedure for initiating that process. So whereas in a normal situation, of, let's say like Metamune, uh, the licensor might feel sandbagged because they felt like they settled a dispute and here comes the licensee start trying to restart things again. That was certainly not the case here. Uh, and I think that's, that's why Justice Kennedy sort of asked and answered his own question when he said I was concerned about fairness to the licensor in whether it was getting sandbagged, but then I realized that under this specific license, uh, they had to give notice and start the whole process, notice of which products were, uh, were in, in, in um, being accused of being liable for royalties. So I guess I would come back to the view that I expressed earlier that I would defend, I agree with the Federal Circuit's conclusion, and like the rest of the panel, I guess, uh, but I would defend it based on the, no not on the notion that you can't file a counterclaim because I agree uh, with Professor LaBelle that there are other situations where you might not be able to file a counterclaim of infringement as opposed to a declaratory judgment of infringement uh, that are not that are not licensing situations. Uh, so I think I would, I would defend the Federal Circuit's holding uh, on, on the ground that this is really a dispute between two parties about the meaning of a contract. And, it, and therefore, it's completely divorced from any consider, considerations of patent law policy. I think once you 
get into patent law policy, this case presents uh, facts that are different from a normal license. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Well, I think um, Justice Kagan asked a question that went to this point, too. And um, she posed a hypothetical um, first to uh, Medtronic, and then the government addressed it as well. Um, that was different from um, this case. And she said, what if um, there's a license, and the license defines the um, infringing products, and the day after, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the day after uh, the parties enter into the license, the licensee wakes up and decides we, we don't want to be bound by that license anymore. Um, and with respect to those accused products that are defined in the license and identified in the license, can um, the can the licensee bring a declaratory judgment action? And if so, um, uh, who should bear the burden of proof? And um, both um, Medtronic and the government addressed that hypothetical and said this is sort of the extreme unfair case to the uh, licensor, right? They negotiate a license, and the next day they're in court um, responding to a DJ action. And um, there were, I think, a couple of really good responses to that question. And um, one, um, uh, Medtronic's counsel, um, Seth Waxman, said, well, there are a number of things that um, patent owners, licensors, can do to prevent that sort of situation. So they can require um, a fully paid up license um, uh, instead of, you know, relying on a royalty stream. They can, um, there can be a provision in the license. Now I think this is questionable, but there can be a provision in the license that if the uh, licensee uh, brings a declaratory judgment action, then that's um, a breach of contract, um, uh, and then they could be could be sued. Um, and he made some other suggestions. And uh, then the government, uh, during its argument, agreed with those suggestions, but also said that this question of fairness is really an issue that should be addressed not with respect to the burden of proof, but it should be a, an, an estoppel question, right? Should, as a matter of policy, should a um, declaratory, uh, should, a, should a licensee be stopped from bringing a declaratory judgment action under those sort of circumstances, those extreme circumstances? Or, um, as a matter of policy, should they not be stopped as um, the Supreme Court uh, held in the Lear case? So. I thought I thought this government's answer was a good one that um, uh, there is this potential for unfairness, but shifting the burden of proof isn't really the right way to address it. Instead, maybe as from a policy perspective, we need to decide whether um, parties should be stopped from uh, challenging uh, licenses, you know, a short time after entering into them. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, you know, it's it's. It's just that, that old saying that, uh, you know, the bad facts make bad law here. And it, this, this, I agree with Rowan. This was an unusual case for, for a number of reasons. It's, it's hardly a typical license agreement, right? This is a license agreement that's really a settlement agreement um, that followed eight years of litigation between these parties and resulted in a cross license of hundreds of patents. And so the typical commercial license agreement does not have a clause in it that says, you know, the licensee can go seek a declaratory judgment action. And that's probably needed. This license agreement was 1991, long before uh, the MedImmune case came out. So that's good, uh, you know, good drafting on their part. Um, but even so, where you have 100 patents licensed and a pretty steep, like, 3 percent royalty on them, then, you know, you as a company who's creating new products, you, you need a vehicle for finding out whether or not you're infringing, whether or not you have to pay that royalty. And this was a reasonable way to make that happen. Um, and so it's, it's very far from the unfair situation, you know, that, that, that's postulated where, you know, maybe you have one patent that's licensed and you know the products that are infringing. This is the point about whether the products are listed or not. You couldn't list all the products and there are new products. And so 
you know, that the, the fairness arguments got distorted, I think, in th this case is not, uh, not an ideal case to, uh, to have this point. Uh, I, I think I would have given Justice Kagan a somewhat different answer. If you start with the license that she asked about, which is called the definition-based license, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the license defines essentially what the subject matter is that's being licensed and the products that fall within that subject matter, uh, ro ro royalties are owed on those. A dispute about whether royalties are owed in that situation would clearly be a contract dispute. And the burden of persuasion would be determined by state law, and there wouldn't be federal question jurisdiction. I think everyone would, well, I would hope that everyone would agree with that. Which then begs the question of what's different if you take the same license and now define its scope in terms of licensed patents rather than a contractual definition. Why does that then suddenly become an inverted patent infringement suit that falls under a rising under jurisdiction? Uh, no one made that point. So just to play devil's advocate here, I mean, the reason you, it would be different is, one, you're listing the products, right? So you don't, have to, you don't have to know the scope of the patent in order to determine whether a product inf is covered by the license or not. In the definition based? In, in the definition based. Not right? necessarily. You could have a definition based license that would apply to products that don't exist yet. <coughs> okay. Uh, but still, you're not using the patent to you're not using the, the You're not using the patents. You could, you could say that we're licensing the patents in the appendix and you, in other words, it's a patent license, but its scope is not defined in terms of patents. We license right. the following hundred patents in the appendix and all continuations, additional ones and such, and you owe royalties on anything that falls within this definition defined by this language. Right. So, I mean, if Justice Breyer is right in saying that there's no difference between infringement and, and claim coverage, right, then there is a difference between those two things because the one is defined by the terms of the contract. We have to read the contract and determine what products are covered by this. And the other one, we have to know what the scope of the patent is, which is involves claim construction, involves reading the patent. And so maybe those, I mean, in some sense, maybe that's what the Federal Circuit is saying is, is the difference. Yeah. The See, if you look at Lear versus Atkins, for example, in Lear versus Atkins, the California Supreme Court construed the patent and undertook an infringement analysis and then decided that Lear owed Atkins money. If you take the position that any time you have to interpret claims or make any kind of infringement determination, that's federal question jurisdiction, a heck of a lot of case license disputes that have been in state courts for 200 years are going to get lifted. And actually, I meant to make that point and forgot. I think one of the perhaps unintended consequences of Medtronic prevailing on its jurisdictional argument is we may get patent issue jurisdiction in the federal circuit because an awful lot of Dis licensing disputes that had previously been thought to be routinely litigable in state court would no longer be litigable in state court anymore. Was this question raised? Did, did you submit an amicus brief at the Federal Circuit? No, because at the Federal Circuit, that was before Gunn versus Mint. So oh. even though our view would be that what we call type one jurisdiction still would not have existed at the time, in other words, that this wouldn't be arising under jurisdiction, under circuit precedent at the time, this, the other type of federal question jurisdiction clearly would have existed. Th those cases, in our view, had been overruled by Gunn. Uh, I'm not as, uh, familiar with the patent law, but I also want to ask a question about if the burden of proof is on Medtronic, will Medtronic face the same level or different level of difficulty when prove non-infringement on literal infringement or equivalent infringement? Uh, in my understanding, maybe Medtronic can prove non-infringement on literal a claim instruction, but uh, how can Medtronic uh, define the equivalent uh, scope? Uh, is, is the first question. And uh, I also wonder when you mentioned about uh, the uh, licensees estoppel, I think this argument may be uh, solved by the Medimmune case. It's, uh, in that case, I think uh, uh, also solved the problem of the licensees estoppel issue. Is, am I right? You want me to? Okay, so uh, the two questions were, if I, if I understood them correctly, one was uh, assuming that Medtronic wouldn't have too hard a time proving literal non-infringement, would it have a harder time proving non-infringement under the doctrine of equivalence? And the second question was, did, did Immune address the question of, lic of licensee estoppel uh, under Lear? 
Uh, I guess with respect to the first question, I would say that uh, actually Seth Waxman uh, addressed this question somewhat at oral argument today. Uh, some aspects of uh, non-infringement under the doctrine of equivalence are the, are the licensees or accused infringers burden in any event. For example, uh, prosecution history estoppel, am amendment-based estoppel under Festo is something that normally uh, would be raised by the uh, licensee as an affirmative uh, defense. Um, or, uh, so any, essentially any legal bar to the doctrine of equivalence, vitiation, estoppel, um, the, the prior art bar, the so-called Wilson Sporting Goods bar, or um, the so-called Johnson and Johnston bar where uh, something is disclosed in the specification but then not literally claimed. Uh, typically in litigation, it's the, it's the accused infringer, in normal patent litigation, it's the accused infringer that brings those issues up anyway. So I'm not sure why it would be any harder uh, for the licensee to raise those issues. Uh, in other words, it's not the patentee that says, oh, we're not, a, in regular patent litigation, it's not the patentee that says, oh, we're not a stop. It's the accused infringer that would point to the prosecution history and said, you said this and this and this, you amended this claim this way. Uh, you're, you, there's festo estoppel with respect to this element or that element. So the same argument, I think, could be made uh, in, a, in a license dispute. And even on the ultimate question of equivalence, uh, although nominally in, right, in normal patent litigation the patentee has the burden of proof, the reality is it's, it's a battle of the experts anyway. Uh, in other words, uh, the patentee has an expert report that says this is insubstantially different, and the accused infringer has an expert report that says no, it is substantially different, and then it, all, and then it gets thrown to the jury. So if it's, all, if it's going to be a battle of two expert reports anyway, uh, it almost doesn't matter as a, in practical terms who has the, who has the burden of persuasion. Um, should I move on to the second question? Or did so the metamune question was whether um, whether metamune resolved the question of licensee estoppel. Um, I think, if I understood the question, and um, it 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 didn't really because um, metamune um, focused on the question of whether um, there could be an Article Three case or controversy when. Uh, licensee in good standing, a licensee that's continuing to pay its royalties brings a declaratory judgment action because um, uh, in Gen Probe v. Vice versus Vices, the Federal Circuit said that there was never um, a reasonable apprehension of suit and therefore never um, uh, an Article III case or controversy uh, in those circumstances. So um, the, the, that's what the Supreme Court reversed in Metamune, but, but the Supreme Court did not specifically address sort of the Lear question that was, that's sort of been lurking in the background for a long time, which is sort of how far does Lear go? And so I, I remember at the Metamune argument, there were questions about whether um, there can be provisions in license agreements that um, either preclude a validity challenge by a licensee or that um, state that yeah, if the licensee brings a declaratory judgment action that it would be, it would constitute a bre breach of the license. So those issues have been raised, they've been discussed, but the Supreme Court hasn't addressed those questions yet. Hi. Uh, thank you for your nice uh, recap seminar. Um, I, I have two questions. Uh, one is about jurisdiction. I'm, I'm quite surprised that the Supreme Court is grappling with this jurisdiction, jurisdictional question because this seems like claim constru uh, uh, the, the Federal Circuit in the in, in Federal Circuit make a judgment about claim construction in, in, the, in, the, in the opinion, the second part of the opinion is about claim construction. And I, I don't see any difference between claim coverage and claim construction. And so that, that means that under, the, under the federal circuit law, the, 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 the question necessarily depends on the resolution of the, um, resolution of the federal 
patent law, and this case, the non-infringement is about, is, is, is it necessarily, in, necessarily depends on the, the outcome of the claim construction. So that resolved the, the jurisdictional matter. And there, Lear versus Atkinson was, it, it's quite, in, in the past case, it, before create, uh, before the Federal Circuit was created, uh, created. So that might be a different issue. And my second question is about the, the, the fairness. The, um, my reading about the, the, the Federal Circuit decision is, is under this post madimian world, uh, post madimian world, there is no coercion um, on, on, on the pat, uh, on licenses part, but there is a lot to lose on the part of uh, the patentee because you can uh, the patentee can't can't assert a counterclaim. But but the, it, is, isn't it contractually possible to 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 make a provision in, in, in the license to raise if you if, if you file if you file any DJ action about validity infringement or enforceability, in, enforceability we can raise the royalty rate and that can count as coercion and because uh, it in 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 this fact that's different but in as a policy matter, policy matter, I think that is also possible. So, the, um, yeah, and yeah, that's my two questions. I guess I should I should take the first one since it goes to jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. I'll defer on the second one. Um, the 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 answer to your question is that under Gunn versus Minton, it's not sufficient for the federal patent issue to be necessarily raised. It, we, we agree that it's necessarily raised here. It also has to be substantial. And prior to Gunn versus Minton, the Federal Circuit had interpreted substantial to basically mean the same as necessarily raised. And in Gunn versus Minton, the Supreme Court said that substantial means that it's important to the federal system as a whole, important to the interests of the federal government. And the meaning of a particular patent is important to the parties, but we took the position uh, that it's not substantial in the sense that it's not important to the federal government or to the federal system as a whole. So that's the reason why we said that there wasn't federal question jurisdiction, even though a federal, even though a federal patent issue was necessarily raised. And I'll let someone else take the, the other question. I can speak to the second question, and, and as you pointed out, that uh, one way for patent holders to mitigate the effects of having these declaratory judgment actions be possible might be to say that if the licensee were to bring such an action, the royalty rate would automatically increase. Uh, that was a suggestion that Seth made at oral argument. He also suggested that you could do more than that. You could say that if the licensee brings a, a declaratory action, that would terminate the license and subject the licensee to uh, to a potential liability for infringement. And I think that question that you raised, I think we agree that that's certainly possible, and I think it it goes to a broader issue that we were discussing here, which is I think even we would acknowledge that there are some situations that can be raised where you have a licensee challenging a patent that seem inequitable, uh, though the one that Justice Kagan posed in her hypothetical, where parties are really in a license, very unlike this one, where parties are really trying to settle a dispute and sort of foreclose future litigation and specifying that certain products infringe and certain products don't. Uh, I think everyone understands the intuition that under those circumstances it's not really fair to then have the licensee come into court the next day and try to litigate it. I think the question that, is, as Megan said, I thought the Curtis Gannon, who argued with the Solicitor General's office, gave a very good answer to those questions, which is those are real policy questions, and they raise questions about whether or not provisions like the one that you describe and the one that we described are enforceable under Lear. And I think those raise interesting and maybe to some extent open questions under Lear, but that the place to adjudicate them is in a, a, a case that raises those questions, that raises questions about what a licensee can and can't raise at all, and about what kinds of license provisions are and are not enforceable, and that changing the burden of proof and shifting it onto the licensee is uh, sort of too little in those situations where there really is a compelling equitable argument that the licensee shouldn't be allowed to challenge the patent at all. And on the other hand, it's also way too much in a case like ours where it's quite clear that the parties didn't intend to settle the dispute. They intended to channel it into a declaratory action. Um, so I would just add to that. You, you uh, said that Lear was decided before the Federal Circuit was established, and that's true. And um, if you look at um, the Federal Circuit cases leading up to GenProbe, um, 
the Federal Circuit was sort of chipping away at this idea of licensee estoppel and then ultimately um, decides in, in GenPro that um, there's no Article III case or controversy. And I think the language the Federal Circuit used is, um, hey, licensees, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, so clearly the Federal Circuit thinks um, th that it's unfair in some situations or in most situations for licensees to be able to bring declaratory judgment action. So my, my guess is these sorts of provisions that were discussed at um, oral argument and that have been discussed here, um, uh, if uh, patent owners start including these provisions, I know some already do include these provisions in their licenses, my guess is if they go to the Federal Circuit, um, the Federal Circuit might think these provisions are just fine, although our Federal Circuit today looks different than it did, you know, a few years ago. Um, but the big question would be what happens at the Supreme Court. Yeah, and I, I would, so I would just um, add on to that that uh, certainly uh, licensors do include these provisions in license agreements today as, as a matter of course. Um, ever since, uh, you know, ever since these uh, the, these cases, uh, ever, ever since Gen, since Gen for Open Vices, but certainly, certainly with Metamune, um, these provisions are are there. And, you know, I, I, I do suspect, I mean, they have, to some degree, the Federal Circuit has heard some cases that sort of skirt the edges or flex foot and so forth, you know, around <coughs> these types of provisions. Um, but. Yeah, that, that's, no, that's no real assurance that the Supreme Court won't reverse the federal circuit. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that in a lot of these license agreements, I mean, they, they are negotiated, right? I mean, there, it's not an unmitigated, you know, unfairness uh, argument here, right? These are negotiated provisions. And unlike an anti-competitive uh, clause in a license agreement that even if it's negotiated by the parties can be struck down, you know, here we're not talking about a violation of the Sherman Act. Um, we're talking about violation of policy under Lear, perhaps. Um, I think the fairness arguments are harder to make. You know, in the normal case where you've got sophisticated parties negotiating with each other, again, this agreement, you know, it's a cross license. It's not a one way license, it's a cross license of hundreds of patents. Um, and the parties negotiated for this. You know, had, had they ne been negotiating that 20 years later, um, they probably would have negotiated in some of the escalation or termination or other penal clauses. And, um, you know, it's hard, hard to make the argument that it's just unfair when it was agreed by two sophisticated parties. Well, I'll just add one comment to that, which is I think it's true. It's hard to make that argument. But in Lear, the Supreme Court said that licen licensees are often the best parties or the only parties who um, have the incentive to challenge these sort of patents. So, um, and that's really what under the policy that underlies the Lair Doctrine. So that's, you know, sort of what we have to keep in mind.